and welcome to The Current uh, for a very special live episode, Humanity on Trial, in partnership with the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice. Uh, the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice is an organization that seeks to change the public's perception of the criminal justice system. I am uh, really delighted to introduce our three panelists. Uh, they are Yusuf Salam, Ruben Jonathan Miller, and Sylvia A. Harvey. Yusuf Salam is the speaker and prison reform activist who, aged 14, was one of the five teenage boys wrongly convicted and sentenced to jail in what became known as the Central Park Jogger case. In 1997, he left prison as an adult to a world he didn't fully recognize or understand. In 2002, the sentences for the Central Park Five were overturned and all five were exonerated for the crime that they didn't commit. He speaks regularly about the effects of incarceration and the devastating impact of disenfranchisement. And he's the author of a new book, Better Not Bitter, Living on Purpose in the Pursuit of Racial Justice. Reuben Jonathan Miller is a sociologist, criminologist, and social worker who teaches at the University of Chicago and the School of Social Service Administration where he studies and writes about race, democracy, and the social life of the city. He's been a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, a fellow of the New America Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation, and a visiting scholar at the University of Texas, Austin, and Dartmouth College. He is the author of Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. Sylvia A. Harvey reports at the intersection of race, class, and policy, and her work has appeared in The Nation, Virginia Quarterly, L, Color Lines, The Feminist Wire, New York Post, and many more. She is the recipient of a National Headliner Award and a National Association of Black Journalists Salute to Excellence Award, and her book is The Shadow System, Mass Incarceration and the American Family. And we really hope that everybody who's joining us today will order their books from our bookseller partner which is Word Up Community Bookstore, a bookshop and art space run by local residents in Washington Heights, many of whom are volunteers. It can be found at 2113 Amsterdam Avenue, the corner of 165th Street, New York City, where they host events for all ages and sell used and new books in English and Spanish. Please check them out at www.wordupbooks.com to place orders or at Word Up Books on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And all the references that I'm reading out are available to you in the chat. You can see them all there. Word Up will be celebrating 10 years in June and reopening for the indoor browsing soon. Um, you can support them by becoming a sustaining member at friends.co slash Word Up or by donating to their GoFundMe campaign. Most importantly, for every book sold through Word Up today in connection with this special episode, the Hachette Book Group will donate a copy to the Million Book Project. You can see the reference to that too in the chat in support of the Prison Library Program. And as a friendly reminder, the current is Hachette's web series and podcast that features a constellation of authors shining insights into the top issues of the moment. You can watch episodes on YouTube or subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I am, though, delighted to hand over the duties uh, of moderating today to Dr. Mark Howard, founder and president of the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice and professor of government and law and the founding director of the Prisons and Justice Initiative at Georgetown University as well as himself, the author of three books and dozens of academic articles, including his most recent book, Unusually Cruel, Prisons, Punishment, and the Real American Exceptionalism. Over to you, Mark. Great, well, thank you, Clive. Uh, and on behalf of the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice, I wanna thank the amazing Hachette and public affairs teams that worked so diligently to put on this event. Um, and for those who are interested in learning more about the Frederick Douglass Project for Justice, and potentially joining us on a prison visit, which we'll be conducting around the country in the near future, uh, please go to our website, douglasproject.org. I'm honored to be joined today by these three remarkable authors and leaders in the fight for criminal justice reform. Better Not Bitter by Youssef Salam, The Shadow System by Sylvia Harvey, and Halfway Home by Ruben Miller are three fantastic books that I recommend to everyone in our audience. And they all fit in perfectly with the mission and purpose of the Douglas Project, namely that through proximity to incarcerated people, we can connect with their humanity and thereby help create much needed policy change. Now, each of these three books blends personal experience with larger storytelling and broader lessons that our society desperately needs to heed. We could really have a separate event for each book and author, and there's just so much to cover, but we only have one short hour together. 
So I'd like to go right into it. And I'd like to start by asking each of the three authors, tell us a little bit briefly about themselves and what motivated them to write their book. Um, so more directly, what do you want people to learn from reading your book? And let's start with Youssef, whose personal story, of course, is already widely known. And then we'll turn to Sylvia and to Ruben. Well, definitely, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all and sharing this moment, especially with the, my fellow and uh, authors. You know, the great thing about, I think, story is that we get the opportunity to tell our story in a way that's impactful. I remember reading the words of Dr. James Baldwin, who said, the victim who can articulate the situation ceases to be the victim. They now become the threat. And I think looking at my story in particular, um, in the context of black, black history or the context of world history, you really get the opportunity to understand that my story was not an anomaly, but is systematic, systemic rather. Um, this is definitely not an episode. Uh, we have a huge problem. And I get to tell my story in a very powerful and impactful way as a story of survival, as a story of grace from God, as a story of being a seed that turns into a beautiful butterfly. You know, thank God we don't look like what we've been through. And so I'm here to stand on that truth and be able to shed light in the world to eschew the darkness around us. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here and thank you all for tuning in. I see you guys in the chat box. Hi. Um, I always say that, yeah, I report at the intersection of race, class, policy, and incarceration, but my initiation into justice work started decades ago. Um, before my sixth birthday, I lost my mother to asthma and my father to a life sentence in prison. So my father served 27 years in prison and just being the daughter of a person incarcerated, I learned so much, right? From having to travel four hours to see him in prison, to have to remove the cornrows in my hair to get past the prison guards because they were afraid that I had tucked heroin in my cornrows, right? To, to know what it means to relinquish my freedom in order to see my father. And then to go into that visit and see that he can't step beyond a certain line, to see that we have to pay a 300% markup to buy him a hamburger, right? So really uh, just being able to see the number of issues that you know people that are incarcerated have to face and their family specifically. So for me, being a daughter meant that I was able to see every aspect of our criminal legal system and not only how it impacts the person incarcerated, but how it trickles down to the entire family and really impacts them for generations to come. So I look at the intersection um, of our um, criminal legal system, our education system, and our child welfare system. Those are all three social institutions that are exacerbated, that exacerbate uh, mass incarceration. So I write about this, report about this because um, I've lived this and now I, I completely, you know, see every aspect of it. I've been following people who've been released from American jails and prisons uh, for the last uh, uh, decade and a half, um, close to roughly about 18 years so this work began I was a volunteer chaplain at the cook county jail and, and i started doing that work out of an ethical impulse i was moved by a scripture um martin 25 which which says you know if uh if i'm did you did you did you feed the hungry did you clothe the naked did you visit the sick and in prison uh, and so and so i went and i started doing this work to visit the sick and in prison and and it was there that i started seeing my neighbors people from my community who will move in and out of jails and prisons i would see them on the outside and so I decided to try to understand what, why, why these things happen and, and why everyone in the jail or prison, not everyone, but about 80% in Cook County look like me. Uh, and so I went to do a PhD in sociology to, to better understand the contours of mass incarceration. And I started doing research, uh, following people out of jails, prisons, and into halfway houses. So, so I'm, I'm doing my work and I'm, I'm doing work specifically in the city of Detroit. And while I'm doing this work, my brother's locked up. Uh, and so I'm following men and women trying to understand how they stitch their lives back together after a bout of incarceration, how they how they wrestle with caring for loved ones who've been locked away. Um, and I myself uh, am, 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 am now in the conundrum of what it means to care for someone who's 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 been locked away. And so what I do in my work is I try to take seriously the idea that mass incarceration has transformed the social world, that the city looks different, that family life looks different that the law and policy apparatus that we've implemented has done harm. Uh, and so I write about that. And I write about what it's like to live through mass incarceration as a, as, as a black man born poor, 
in a segregated part of a city I grew up in Chicago um, who couldn't have avoided the prison even if I wanted to. So that's that's the skinny um, on the book. Great. Uh, now, let me turn to another general question and have Sylvia start uh, answering. So based on your own experience, uh, at least for Yousef inside, uh, and as a family member uh, for Sylvia and Ruben, and also your research, um, if you could share a little bit about your views of the humanity of incarcerated people and how that is understood, or probably more accurately put, is misunderstood by broader society. So based on what you've seen yourselves, and what you know, how is the rest of society that has very little contact, perhaps, or certainly doesn't publicly acknowledge it, um, the connection with incarceration, what are they missing? Yeah, I always say that they're missing the idea that these people belong to something larger than themselves. There's this concept that once you're incarcerated, your life simply vanishes and you disappear and you no longer cease to exist but you still exist to your family, you still exist to your community, you still exist to all the people that support you. But that's not something that we think about as a larger society because we're so focused on how do we punish this person and what kind of crime do they commit? So I think the more we think about what justice really is, what equity really is, and what it means to have the services in place so that we don't have so many people you know, behind bars, but also being able to see how does this impact these families specifically? So when I look at, you know, families, if I look at a, one of the young men in my book, Randall, he's incarcerated when he's 20 years old and he's sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for a murder conviction, right? So I think from the outside, people say, oh, well, he, you know, he committed murder. He should spend the rest of his life in prison without the possibility of parole. And for me, it's for, my job is to show you his humanity is for me to go back to when he was 10 years old and his mom was working these three fast food jobs, different parts of uh, Miami, and he was home, right? And when he you know, was on his school grounds as a elementary school student, staring at a security guard with one arm because he thought it was peculiar, right? And to have backup calls in that, hey, I don't like what this young black boy is doing. I don't like the way he's looking at me. And the idea of this young boy, 11, throwing a rock at a security guard and that leading to him being incarcerated for the first time. So being put into the criminal legal system, the school to prison pipeline, funneling this boy into our system at 11. And then from there, he's already being tracked. So the next time he got into a fight, he got expelled. Then he got sent to um, an alternative school. Alternative school, he had access to drugs. So once you have access to drugs, you start selling the drugs. So it's not a huge wonder that we then see him at 20 in a drug dispute over land that doesn't belong to him, but he believes belongs to him because of everything that has been denied to him. And that's not to take away his responsibility because he remains responsible. But if we're able to go back and track what he has seen, what he has experienced, what he has been denied, then we recognize that, okay, this is a man. This was a man that at some point was a young black boy that was severely neglected and came from a community that was under-resourced and had absolutely nothing to offer him. So this is a human. He's done something uh, that we can say is horrendous and he's paying for that. But how do we go back and see, well, how did he get here? What could we have done as a community? And then think about his daughter, which wasn't even born when he was uh, convicted. And now she's 11. What has her life been like? What has she lost? What does she see? What does she feel? What does she experience? And what for his mother? How much has she spent in commissary and visits? All of this stuff is, is a way for us to see that not only is the incarcerated person human, but they have people that care about them and love them and support them and recognize their humanity. So transcending um, that and saying, hey, I'm not just the worst thing I've ever done but I am a human and I, you know, am someone that you should see and you should see all of me, the whole three dimensions. So that's something I feel like I've seen and I've reported on through the book is, hey, this is not just a person convicted of this crime. All these things happen. And I want you to look at every step of the way and every system that was in place or was not in place that, you know, um, helps him get to where he is. Yousef. 
powerful, you know, um, I'm happy that she laid that foundation down because, you know, as I was thinking about my remarks, I couldn't help but think about the 13th Amendment and specifically Section 2 of the 13th Amendment that specifically says Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And so the seeds of the impact of incarceration and really the impact of what it means to live in the margins of life begins to flourish, right? inside of the community and in the community therefore we have what is considered and what's termed generational curses and in, in these generational curses there's this disconnect to understand that all of the conditions that we find ourselves in say for instance poverty as one condition we understand it as a crime when we really understand what's going on that on the chessboard of life most people haven't even been playing chess. They've been playing checkers, right? And so as we try to figure out what the, what the missing piece is, the missing piece is that this system is not broken. This system is operating exactly as it was designed in the minds of the creators of this system. And if we go all the way back to the founding documents, the, the ratification of America with the Constitution of the United States, we find that in the first few words, when we read, we the people, and we pause and we do a deep dive in the historical reference and reality of that time, what do we find? We find that black and brown bodies weren't considered full human beings. That has never been reformed. And so what we see, even though the prison industrial complex looks overwhelmingly black and brown and people of color, the truth of the matter is that the system is created that way in order to make us believe that we are a crime. And if we believe that we are a crime, then we move throughout our lives like we are mistakes, when the exact opposite of that is the truth. But the problem is that too many of that bad seed has been sprinkled around, and too many of those seeds have been watered with the negativity of life, that we choose sometimes the worst option. It was Malcolm X that said that when he was in prison, he realized that the people who never came back were the people that were becoming educated. Why didn't they come back? They didn't come back because for one, they realized their importance by realizing that they had more options than the option, the option, right? They had more options with an S than the option without the S that was, a, that was given to them. And so they said to themselves, I can choose better than this one thing that the system wants me to be. I can break the generational curses starting with myself so that my family and my community and the generations to come understand that packaged in our dioxyribonucleic acid is the seed of everything great. Yeah, thanks Yusuf. As someone who's very involved in prison education and uh, sees the research in that, education is the key for getting out of this morass. And uh, sadly, uh, it's rarely provided and, and prisons are really the opposite. And as you see, spending in this country on prisons, on incarceration skyrocketed at the same time as funding for education disappeared. Um, so uh, I completely agree. Ruben, I know you have a lot to say on this as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I do. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be brief because I have to be. Uh, but but I, I will say, no, this is absolutely right. I mean, education is an absolute key. And what does education do? I mean, so, so, so what education does is it prevents things, prevents things like what? Prevents things like the rug from being swept up from under you. So, so this brother that, 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 that my dear sister Sylvia talked about had the rug swept from under him at 11 years old. I saw the same thing often in my work. I followed 250 people across American cities for about 10 years. And the average age of arrest for the guys was around 11. And for the, for the girls, the average age of arrest uh, was a little later. 14, 15, 16, they tell me they start getting arrested. Well, what are you arresting an 11-year-old boy for? What could an 11-year-old be doing? In this case, throwing a rock? <laughs> what, what, could, what, what, could, what could an 11-year-old be doing? Well, the literature tells us, the social science and social psychology literature tells us that Black boys especially, but Black girls too, are seen as older and more guilty than their white counterparts. Four years older on average, so says the brilliant work of Philip Atibagal. Uh, and so, and so, and so, and so, and so the rug, what does education do? Education provides a place for people. 
it, it opens opportunities. So it's not just, on the one hand, there's the psychological, spiritual, emotional stuff that is internal and necessary for people to be able to muscle through. On the other hand, there's a whole world of opportunity that opens up when people have access to education, different kinds of labor that they were previously, uh, which was previously inaccessible uh, to them. Also, a different kind of regard in the public. If you go and you say, I've been to prison, but I have a bachelor's degree, people view you differently than someone who says, I spent my time in a cage and, and I don't. This is a problem. The way we view people is, 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 is probably the problem, how we view people. But, 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 but what do we do when we know this? We've known for years that uh, people, for example, who do some college are something like two thirds less likely to go back to jail or prison than people who have not. What's our response? We cut the Pell Grant in response to that deep knowledge. <laughs> and we said, and we said, we said, in response to that deep knowledge, I'm gonna shut up in two seconds. In response to that deep knowledge, we say no education for you. We say you can't get, you can't get a, a, a loan if you've got a drug conviction. <laughs> That's what we said. But, but, but we did this in other areas, too. This is what I mean about, about the rug that we pull out from under, under people. 45,000 laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that target people with criminal records and only people with criminal records. We say if you're a woman getting out of prison, we say in California, we said for many years, until there was the advocacy of people like the, the esteemed Susan Burden, who's just incredible, uh, we said she couldn't get welfare benefits because we want to punish our kids. You know, and so, so anyway, the, 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 the impulse to punish, the, 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 the belief that, 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 that the young brothers, as Sylvia mentioned, and, and the brothers that we follow, and even Yousef himself, and even me, of course, I was arrested too, like every other black man in the country, of course I was arrested. You know, the, 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 the belief that we're guilty starts long before, and this is what we have to tackle, and education helps, helps change the image. It, 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 it helps change the image. But what we have to do really is attack this impulse. We need new narratives that prevent people, this whole people, that, that, that prevent the good and bad of it, right? It's, it's, it's not just muscling your way out of poverty and, 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 then, and then you're all good. You can't, you can't, you can't muscle your way through 45,000 laws, policy dimensions, 19,000 labor market restrictions in this country right now today. 1,000 restrictions on housing when you walk out of that American jail or prison. This is, this is what we're looking at. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Ruben, and thank you for sharing your outrage, because I think people need to be outraged about this. Um, you mentioned the Pell Grants. I just want to have a little piece of good news, which is that they were recently restored um, and that there's an increasing number of prison education programs that are flourishing. And I'm also proud to say that Georgetown, which has been offering credit bearing and non-credit classes since 2018, is going to start next year a degree granting program for incarcerated students. Uh, and there are more universities that are getting involved in this area. Um, I want to uh, get to, in a minute, the central question of race, which is at the core of every single element of the criminal justice system. But I also want to ask a little interlude here about family, because I know that for each one of you, family has played such a critical role in your experience of incarceration, whether it's directly or indirectly. There's this expression that says, the family does the time too, right? And everybody that I talk to inside or outside with someone inside shares that view about how deep it is. Youssef, you obviously did time yourself on the wrongful conviction of the Central Park Five, but your mother played such a pivotal role in, in your life and in your well-being and the advocacy for you. I mean, it's just so beautiful and, and extraordinary, um, the, the bond that you have and what she did for you from the very beginning, from the very day you were wrongfully arrested. Um, Sylvia, your father, of course, with his decades of incarceration, is really the starting point and the grounding for your work in this area. And Ruben, your brother, and I know many other people around you from where you grew up um, have that. And that, that connection um, that drives you personally, I'd like you to share a little bit about that. If you could dig into yourself um, and share what the role of family has been in your different connections with incarceration. Um, and maybe we'll start with Ruben to switch it up. Yeah, I very, I very much appreciate that. I mean, as I mentioned, you know, I would see people from my neighborhood moving in and out of the Cook County Jail when I was there as a volunteer chaplain. Uh, and as I mentioned, my brother was 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 locked away while I was doing the, the research for this book. And it was it was it was it. You know, I'd like to say something. Um, so I, I, I the the work for me started as an intellectual as, as one was a kind of a moral conviction, like my own, like my like this was what I thought was going to be the ministry or something like that. And the second side of it was 
a kind of intellectual curiosity. Okay, now what's going on here, et cetera. Um, but the point was that you can't avoid it if I couldn't have avoided it if I wanted to. I couldn't, you know, I, I, I couldn't have escaped uh, the U.S. prison system. I mean, for 27 straight years, we incarcerated more people. Uh, and overwhelmingly, those were people of color. That's the mass and in mass incarceration. It's the targeting of social groups. Is the mass and in mass incarceration. Of course, by social groups, we're thinking about black people and specifically black men, um, quite a bit. But what I found were, were, were many things about family and the family dynamic while I was doing this work. You know, on the one hand, there's the real burden that's just completely unaccounted for. This is something that Sylvia had mentioned in, in her, her opening remarks, the fact that people don't think about families. I mean, nobody thinks of the prosecutor, the judge, uh, juries don't think about the fact that half the people we incarcerate are parents, right? Like, like let alone somebody's cousin, brother's son, nephew, a member of that community, our parents. And with women, it's even higher, over two thirds, half of them being uh, the primary caregiver of their children. So when you incarcerate a woman in this country, you break up a family system. It's what you do. You separate children from their, from their, from their, from their primary, from their primary caregivers. And there's a burden that the family bears that that, that is unique. Um, that, that that I won't spend a lot of time with. But 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 what I will spend time with are are are, are the unaccounted for um, uh, costs to people like siblings. So so just staying there. I mean, so there was the psychological weight of trying to explain what it meant to my children, uh, why their uncle was in jail or prison. There were the, there were the professional costs uh, that may have been associated with having a brother in prison. I mean, I'm doing research in Michigan prisons at the time that my brother's in a Michigan prison. How do I explain this to the warden? <laughs> right? like that, I'm trying to sort of move in and through, right? Like this question, like, do I have contraband in my cornrows? Thank you. Thankfully, no cornrows. <laughs> so no, 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 no contraband. <laughs> Sylvia. But, 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 there, but there's, there's a, a, an unaccounted for weight of burden uh, that people share. So much so that, that organizations like Sesame Street are now taking these questions very seriously. And it's, it's just a beautiful thing to me. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, Sylvia, why don't you go next? Yeah, I feel like it's, it's always so much, kind of like Ruben. I feel like once I get started, there's so much that I'm like, all right, let me pick some of these pieces that um, I think are most profound. I think that for me, because my mother had already died, my father at that point was a single parent, right? So for me to be in the back seat of his, you know, Blue Nova while he's working construction, right? Because my brothers were in school and I was too young to be in school and he didn't want child, so he didn't want social services to come and take me. So that meant that he was sneaking me to work with him. That meant I was in the back seat playing with my Cabbage Patch doll. He's checking on me as he's like laying bricks and, you know, banging on nails until his supervisor comes and says, this is not allowed, right? So you're put in a position where you feel like you don't have many opportunities. You don't have many resources. So once he's incarcerated, the question is, where does this family go now? Where do these four boys and this one girl go, right? Do we split them up amongst family? Do we let them go into the child welfare system? Do we even trust foster care? And there's this whole issue of, no, as, as black people, brown people, as poor people, you don't even trust the systems that are supposed to take care of you. So at this point, my grandmother is like, okay, I'll take all of them, right? So we're all sort of in this, you know, two bedroom apartment with my extended cousins and aunts and they were sleeping four or five to a bed because we need to take care of ourselves. Our family had to come together and figure out how do we take care of these kids? How do we make sure they don't go into the system? And that was, you know, a huge part of, of recognizing what poverty looks like and how you overcome it, even without support from your government, even without support from anyone else, you step in and you say, all right, you four are sleeping in that bed. You're going to be with your aunt. We're going to get four bunk beds in here and everybody's going to figure it out. We're going to take turns taking them up to visit their father. You know, and then you think when there's no, no money, there's no time to take off work to travel six hours so that you can go see your father. Like, what does that look like? What does that mean? And then when my father doesn't call me for a month and I'm crying, like, you don't love me. You know, he writes me a letter every day to let me know, no, I do love you. It's not that I don't love you. It's that your grandma couldn't pay the exorbitant amount for the collect calls so her phone was cut off. Baby, I love you. Here's the proof. These are the letters. But this is something that the family has to bear. Like my grandmother had to say, do I feed these kids this week or do I let them talk to their dad, right? Having to make those 
very hard choices because we have a system in which people want to profit off of mass incarceration. Like it's a billion dollar industry, um, the correctional phone industry. You can spend up to $25 for a 15 minute phone call. That should not be allowed. There's no reason, you know, you go on a family visit or a regular visit and you have to pay a 400% uh, percent markup on frozen food that could likely give you high blood pressure and diabetes. But we don't think about the family. We don't think about the structure. We just know we want to punish this person. And by default, anyone else that loves and care or supports this person will also be punished. So just really think all the way that punishment just creeps into every person in that family down to my brothers, right? All four black males having come into contact with our criminal legal system, not because, you know, their father was incarcerated, like a lot of people believe, but because we have structural inequality embedded in every aspect of our criminal legal system. So that's why, right? And until we change that, families will continue to be impacted on multiple levels. All right. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, that's powerful, and we're going to get into that to that the systemic questions. But I want to give Youssef a chance to talk, and particularly if he if he wants about the connection to his mom uh, and what she went through as he went through it himself. Yeah, you know, um, uh, everything that has been said is is important and is impactful and is necessary. You know, when I think about what happens when they disappear us from society until you become awaken to the American nightmare, you really don't know what it is that's going on. You just think, oh, so-and-so chose badly. You don't realize that in the communities that we come from, there's a seed that has been planted and that seed says you're gonna be dead or in jail before you reach the age of 21. And not many people in the communities that have been pushed to the margins of society ever say to themselves, hold on, I, I, I didn't plan this for myself, right? How is this a truth and a reality in my community that I've accepted this seed to be my truth? And we know that it's true because a lot of people in our community are dead or in jail before they reach the age of 21, myself included. But when you, when you look at what happens, this whole aspect of this is not just an individual that you are penalizing, right? On the one hand, you have people going to prison for crimes that they have not committed. Some people have been in prison for upwards of 40 years. And I know this because of the work that I do with the Innocence Project, you know? And the Innocence Networks around the country have been proving through DNA evidence that these, in these individuals have not done these different crimes that they have been purported to commit. But then you look at the Caliph Browders of the world, and I'm using all of these examples before I really talk about my mom, right? Caliph Browder, he's in prison, and we know the story in terms of New York history, you know, he's in prison on Rikers Island for three years before they finally say, after trying to pressure him into agreeing to a lesser charge for a crime he didn't commit in the first place, they finally say, listen, okay, we're going to let you go. You know, a great documentary was created about him and, and about his life, and he could not turn off the trauma, though, the trauma of the experience, and he ends up taking his own life. My mother says often that you have to learn to deal with the experience that you're going through, because if you don't deal with it in a way that helps, it metastasizes into something else, right? And my mother's a stage four cancer survivor. I think three times at least she survived and got rid of it. But what they're doing is they're pulling at the fabric of the fiber of the family. And when you pull at the fabric of the family and of community, my mother as a as a person who worked in the in in, in the um I forget the actual name of the industry itself, but I don't want to say garment industry, right? Because <laughs> it's bigger than that. She was creating, you know, designs for people to wear. She told us often that she used to, you know, tailor suits that Billy D. Williams made. She's in the room with folks like Donna Karen. She's a professor at Parsons University. So she told us often that you can't take, when you see a piece of um, thread coming out of a cloth, you have to snip it. You can't pull it because if you pull it, it's gonna leave a gaping hole. My mother was able to take this nightmare that she was awakened to being told by my sister at the time 
that the police came and got me and she thought that we were playing a joke on her. After looking around the house and under the bed and under the couch, she then realized that this was the nightmare that she never wanted for us. And she quickly got down to the precinct. And more important than that is that how she participated in my freedom happened from day one in that she allowed herself to be a part of this great thing called the prison industrial complex. She came to see me often. She learned the players in the game and um, figured out ways to get in and involved. At one point coming into the prison, cooking for the facility with a group that she created called Mother Love at the time, which turned into People United for Children. And, in, and you know, when I think about just the idea of what we're all up against, I think about survival. And what do people do when they have to survive? They do anything to survive. Their humanity being stripped from them doesn't give them the opportunity oftentimes to even think. And so black and brown bodies, just like the 13th Amendment, second part, section two rather, black and brown bodies are not even looked at as innocent until proven guilty. Because the way that the laws have been set up is that we are the culprits and we have to prove that we are innocent because we are seen as a crime. And the other thing I think in terms of family is that the biggest aspect is the psychosocial aspect. First resonating in our families. And if our families are not closely connected in their understanding of who we are, and I'm not even talking about who individuals are as a people, I'm talking about who we are as walking miracles, who we are after our families, our mothers and fathers got together and participated in the birth process, that we were one of over 400 million options and we made it. And so the fact that we made it, the fact that we survived means that we were born on purpose. The fact that we survived means that we have a purpose and the system is trying to destroy that, right? One of the most grounding principles in Islam is that you have to maintain your family ties. You have to keep it tight and knit and, 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 and be a part of that. You can't allow that to dissipate because what happens when it dissipates? Part of the natural rule is divide and conquer. Part of the natural law is even with the Harvard study, right? I never forget, I forget who it was that did this in terms of who actually participated in part of the study, because when I heard him say this, I kind of chuckled to myself and said, wow, he was talking about implicit bias. And he said how, when he took the test himself, he failed. And he said, no, this can't be right. And how this seed of, of, of devalue has been placed in our own selves to make us believe that as we are seeing a Yusuf Salam, Kevin Richardson, Corey Wise, Antron McCray, um, Raymond Santana walking across the, 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 the television screen at 14, 15, and 16 year old, we forget that these are children. They're seen as crimes. They're seen as being guilty, having to prove themselves innocent. When 13 years later, the truth comes out and it, it becomes a whisper. My mother said that she wondered if the rats in New York City even heard. And so the impact that I think it has on family is, is far reaching because it continues the, the seeds of, of, of devalue to be placed in the community and allows for the families to feel like we are born crimes and we, are, we have to continue these generational curses. When we, we have to do what my mother said, when she first came and got me out of the interrogation room, she told me that they needed me to participate in whatever it was that they were trying to do. And she said to me not to participate. She said, do not participate, refuse. Family is, is, is everything. Thank you, Yusef. And yeah, your mom is an extraordinary person. Uh, and frankly, Sylvia and Ruben, you are too, through, through your love for your family members and your support. And also now for the work that you're doing, which is really um, trying to get the rest of society to connect with incarcerated people like family. Right? to understand that bond and not to view them as other, as other people, as different, but essentially to have that same love for each other 
that you've demonstrated in your lives, those connections with family. I want to turn now, there's two themes that I want to cover. Um, first, and this has come up quite a bit, obviously there are overwhelming racial inequalities in every aspect of the criminal legal system. That's undeniable, that is factually true. From poverty, and we talked a little bit about all the seeds that, that go into the conditions that lead to crime, but then of course the racial profiling, the over-policing of communities, the police brutality, which finally uh, the society has seems to have recognized, uh, to lack of adequate legal representation, and of course mass incarceration itself. Um, and then within that, racially segregated prison housing units, um, who gets sent to solitary confinement, there are racial disparities at each and every single stage of the criminal legal system. My question is that so we could talk about that for a long time and you all write about that in your books. Given the recent push for greater racial equality that we've seen over the past year, do you see the situation improving or is this just sort of on the margins uh, for show uh, and why or why not? And so maybe start with Sylvia. Um, first I wanna say I do recognize that there is movement, that there is action, that there are people from all walks of life that would have never thought about racial inequity or thought about what it means to seek justice or equality or any of that. And I think that that is, is great. But I do feel like when it comes to mass incarceration, um, we as a society are not really, you know, getting to the center of it. I think that we're operating um, on the, you know, on the outside, just on the parameter, right? Or perimeter. I think that a big issue is that we're not thinking about people um, that are convicted of serious and, um, you know, just in general, serious crimes, right? People that are convicted of murder, people are convicted of very serious offenses. They, they make up over 50% of our prison population. And I think we have to be able to, you know, make edits to legislation that impacts that demographic in order for us to really see some movement around mass incarceration. It's one thing for us to think about legislation that, you know, uh, focuses on people that are wrongly convicted, people that um, are in for minor crimes and things like that. But I feel like that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we don't think about how all these people are convicted of these serious offenses, violent offenses, and think about what needs to be in place to change that, then we're not gonna be able to change it. There's a little bit of action, I think, happening now um, with the call to reduce life sentences to 20 years, right? And to, I think it's like, I don't know how many, maybe over 20 um, different states are looking at legislation that reviews unfair and old, you know, sentencing. So we do have some action happening, but for the most part, we're not thinking about serious and violent crime as a way to end mass incarceration. Like, we don't think about the serious and violent offenses and how to actually um, work on reform and rehabilitating these people. It, we're not gonna we're not gonna make a big enough dent. Like, it's not enough to just work around. You know, oh, you're not gonna get arrested for marijuana. That's great. We never should have been arrested for that. You're not gonna get arrested for public. Um, exposed. You should have never been arrested for these things, right? But we're talking about once you are arrested, why are people getting 300 years? Why are you getting life without the possibility? Like, those are the sentences I think we need to look at. We need to think about why this is happening. And we can look to other countries that are, are not even thinking about sentencing people to 70, 200 years. And, mm. you know, how it hasn't changed their public safety is still intact, right? Like, we have to stop believing this narrative that, oh, public safety is, you know, somehow improved when we incarcerate people for these long sentences. There are no studies that have proven that. It's been the complete opposite, that prisons don't make us safer. So we need to start thinking about what really makes us safer. And those are resources. Those are things that are missing in every community that's impacted by mass incarceration. So I just say we have to think about the serious and violent offenses and the people that are you know, make up more than 50% of our, our state yeah. prison population. Yeah, there's a convenient myth that frankly, President Obama perpetuated and many others have, which is that uh, our prisons and jails are just filled with nonviolent drug offenders. Right. 
Right. And that, that has been helpful in some way, but actually harmful in other ways. And it's pushed the problem down the road that we really need to get into, which is the humanity of everybody. Yeah. Um, Ruben, I know you want to say, add something here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for that. I, I think that, that's, that's, that's so right. I mean, thinking about people who committed violent offenses, people who did them, did them um, uh, as, as kind of a key here. I, I see great progress uh, uh, in that there are new narratives that are taking hold now um, that, 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 weren't, that weren't available in the mainstream before. Not, not that there weren't, I mean, so for example, the abolitionist critique of the criminal justice system, the abolitionist position that, that, that we should not only get rid of American jails and prisons, but we, we must produce a society that has no need for them. This is also like the abolition as a positive project. So whether you're an abolitionist or not, the idea that, 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 that one might think about how society might be ordered in such a way that we don't produce this problem of mass incarceration. Also, the, 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 the push for racial justice um, uh, is, 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 is very important. I think it's also important to stay away from a trap which would be to make an exceptionally punitive system more equal. So, so, so right now, uh, uh, you know, something like one in two black women has a loved one who's been to an American jail or prison. The, the, the research on connectedness to incarceration tells us that. This comes from Hedy Lee and colleagues, um, the brilliant Hedy Lee from Washington University. And, and, uh, and there are other steps that tell us um, uh, uh, similar things, you know, like 65% or so of Black people have a loved one who's ever been to an American jail or prison. But, but one in eight white women has a currently incarcerated loved one in this country. And so, and so while mass incarceration targets Black people, one in eight white women, 30, okay, 49% of Black boys will be arrested before they turn 23 in this country. That's egregious. That's awful. It's incredible. We've known that since 2016. But 38% of white boys will be incarcerated, will be arrested rather, before they turn 23 for a non-traffic violation. And so, and, so, and so what we don't want is we don't want a more equal punitive system. Punishment is the problem. It, it, racism is a giant problem. And punishment, this, this logic of punishment. So, 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 so why do I think the abolitionists are, are pushing us in directions that we need to go? It's because they're calling for a politic of care in my book, I call for a politic of hospitality. I think about a brother, Ronald Simpson Bay, who is brilliant and amazing and whose ears burn every time I give a talk because I can't help but talk about him. You know, he does 27 years. He's 27 years convicted on a wrongful conviction, you know, but he's not, he's not, you know, innocent in the ways that, 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 that we typically think. Like he's not, he's not, he's, he's, he's used to be a gun toting dude, you know, doing his thing, but he didn't do that crime. He didn't, he didn't shoot at this cop who, for which he got 50 years, which is a yes. Uh, uh, but anyway, while he's incarcerated, his, his son is killed. His son is murdered. While he's doing 27 years on a wrongful conviction, his son is murdered on Father's Day. He should be here to tell his own story, and I'm sure mm -hmm. he'll hope for so on. But anyway, long story short, he advocates for the murder of his child that he be tried as a juvenile, not an adult. And I ask him why. And he says, because he's a human being that deserves a place in the world. Not because he loves them, not because they're doing pizza dinners together, doing a tour, traveling. He didn't take them as his own son or something like that. No lifetime movie out of this. What he did was he made an ethical commitment to a politics of care, an ethical commitment to make a place for people that belong, even people that harm them. This is where I think the action is. It's amazing. Is, we view people as human beings that deserve a place in the world just because they're human, yeah. not because of what yeah. they did or didn't do. Yeah, we're starting to run low on time, so I'm going to ask you all to be extra concise in the answers. And I want to turn to some audience questions, and I got a whole bunch of them, uh, and I'm going to just pick a few. But Yusef, I want to give you a chance to say something very brief about this, then I have one more question for all of you. Yeah, um, yeah, we definitely need a part two. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot to say um, with regards to this. You know, I think the idea of uh, are we making progress? You know, I think about George Floyd and and you know the outcome of that particular trial, right? The Derek Chauvin trial, and you know we have to be careful. I think in regards to how we communicate what we're talking about, because we often have been communicating in in such a way where we'll say the Emmett Till trial, the George Floyd trial, the Tra Trayvon Martin trial, right? When these people were the victims 
of the system. And in my in my belief and and vision of what has been going on, I know we've been playing the tango. I know we have two steps forward, 15 steps back. That's what the system does to us as a people. And when I'm talking about us as a people, I'm definitely not just talking about, about black and brown folks, right? I'm talking about the good people who are part of the kaleidoscope of the human family today. And one of the realities that we see is that, is there a need for what we have to cease to exist? Absolutely. Does that mean that we live in a state of lawlessness and no system? Absolutely not. The biggest problem is this, that as we look at these issues that we are tackling, these issues aren't being pulled out of thin air. These are issues that people have created who, who, who utilize their mind and said, I want the system to work like this. Those individuals who have attached themselves to spiritual wickedness should be in the system. And I'm not talking about the system that we have. I'm talking about as we build a new system with the bricks of abolition, that system will disallow for spiritual wickedness to rule the day. It will disallow for darkness to be a part of our reality. We will turn up our own lights and eschew the darkness around us. But the fact that we have to do that, the fact that we know that that is something that is existing, that there's so much pushback, it tells us something very real dark in the other side of the story. And I just want to leave it there. Thanks. Yeah. And I want to follow up on, on a theme that's come up a few times. And I want to highlight that there's a tension here, not necessarily among you three, but certainly in kind of a larger movement. And that's this question of wrongful convictions and innocence, which on the one hand suggests, even if it's not always said this way, but that the people who did commit their crimes, who were not innocent of the crime for which they were convicted, deserve what they get. And that therefore we need to take out, kind of pluck out, save wrongfully convicted people. And then everyone else belongs there and deserves what they get. I know obviously, Yusef, you're not saying that. Frankly, just about everyone I know who's been wrongfully convicted and exonerated. And I do a lot of work in this area and just helped get another exoneration that just took place 10 days ago in Philadelphia, Eric Riddick, amazing story, and do all my work with Marty Tankliff, who himself spent 17 years in prison for, before being exonerated. So this is a question that's very close to home, but there's that tension and it always bothers me because there's some people who get so excited about wrongful convictions. It's kind of like with nonviolent drug offenders that they think, ah, the hell with everyone else. And I know you're not saying that, but I'd love to hear your views and now we're down to like soundbite length um, on this question and on this tension between innocence and what you might call a humanization movement, the innocence movement, the humanization movement. Can we somehow reconcile and bring those together? Uh, let's start with Ruben. Yes, we can and must reconcile and bring those things together. The abolitionist lawyers who work in innocence clinics, for example, I'm sure you've run into um, some. And what what I think the problem is is a really immature discourse. So like the, like like so 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 the 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 the, the victim offender binary that, that that that's that's a complete that's a that's an immature position to take. Uh, now, now that doesn't mean that that to be locked up for something you didn't do isn't egregious and isn't a very specific kind of insult. That, that, that might even present a hurdle that's much harder perhaps to get over than being locked away for 50 years for something that maybe somewhere you, 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 can, you can latch onto some sense of guilt for. But, but in my soundbite response, uh, that what we need is, and this is, this is more than soundbite, but I'm, I'm stopping. What, what we need is, 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 is a more mature discourse. That, that, the, the, the way out of the tension, uh, if the, to the extent the tension exists, is, 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 to be, is to be more honest and more adult about about the lives of people. Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. Uh, yeah, I think that this comes back down to this concept of humanity, right? Of course, these are very different issues, and I don't think they necessarily have to be married or looked at separately, but say, yes, as Ruben mentioned, this is egregious in and of itself that we have a system that's so broken that somebody can be wrongly convicted. And that takes nothing away from us saying, yes, even this person that is convicted of this crime 
Should they be sentenced to 300 years? Should they be kept in a place where it's rat feces and there's urine and there's no mattress that you can sleep on and there's no electricity or there's, you know, no air conditioning, you're sweating in a place that's 110 degrees? Is that humane? I think we need to yeah. spin all this judgment of, oh, what did he do? What didn't he do? What did she do? What didn't she do? And say, well, listen, let's just start at the base that this person is a human and then work back from there. Great. And a big part We're of down to one minute. Oh, go. For the Sorry, whole event, <laughs> Unfortunately, and I want to give Yousef a chance to answer because he's part of the most famous wrongful conviction case in the country. Yeah. Uh, you know, in my soundbite, I just want to say this, that those individuals who are impacted by the spike wheels of justice have to be at the seat of the tables that are discussing this type of thing. Because I, I think that what you'll find is a very robust outlook and opportunity to really have a, a more mature conversation. Because I do believe, as Ruben's saying and everyone is talking about, that is very immature. The, 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 the level that we're at right now is not full enough. And the fullness has to include people who have who have been impacted and also their families. Yeah. Um, thank you, Yousef. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Ruben. It's been an amazing conversation. Uh, I tried to integrate some of the audience questions. We didn't get to have a dedicated uh, audience q and I'm so sorry. I think that just speaks to the fact that there's so much to cover. Uh, we need to have a part two. These are three amazing books, three amazing authors and leaders who are really helping to change this country and bring humanity back into it where it belongs. And so thank you all for joining us and thanks again to our participants. It's been a wonderful event. It's been an honor for me to be your moderator and I look forward to continuing the conversation in many forms in the future. I think, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Well. Hachette.